Please stand by. Good day, everyone, and welcome to today's Hubble Power Systems Chance Cutout Quality Conference Call. All lines will be open for the duration of today's call, and we ask that you please use your mute button when not speaking to reduce the background noise. Additionally, do not place your phone on hold, as doing so will feed music into the entire conference. Just a reminder, today's call is being recorded, and now I'd like to turn the conference over to Charles Worthington. Please go ahead, sir. All right. I want to thank everybody for joining the last um, segment of our uh, cutout webinar. Um, since we have such a small group today, we're going to go ahead and do the question and answers a little bit more informally than we've done in the past for those who have joined before. Um, with a group of uh, roughly around 20 people, we'll um, keep the floor open for everybody to ask questions as we move through the presentation. Um, if you would, though, so we can, uh, if multiple questions arise at the same time, on your live meeting software, there should still be a Q&A tab up in the top, um, should be the third tab down, and there is a raise hand button. If you could use that button, that will uh, that'll signal me to, um, to call you out, and you can go ahead and ask your question as we're presenting. So as I mentioned, this is the third segment of the cutout webinar. Today is going to be covering quality. And we will get started here with the summary. So we're going to, for those who have joined before, we're briefly going to go through the chance history, um, where the Type C cutout design originated from. And we'll get into critical components of the cutout, incoming inspection for the manufacturer and the user, and then follow up with routine testing. So I think, as most of you already know, uh, having been in these conferences before, uh, Hubble was originally established, or Hubble Incorporated was originally established back in the early 1900s, around the same time AB Chance was founded. In the uh, late 70s, AB Chance released the Type C porcelain cutout, which is now also available in Polymer, as you'll see on the, uh, the main title page for our presentation. And those accommodate the S&C and the ABB style fuse holders as well now, um, making interchangeability a uh, pioneering design change in the uh, early 80s. Um, in the mid-90s, Hubble Power Systems acquired Chance, and shortly thereafter we started moving production into Mexico, and we also now have a plant in Wuhu, China. So to move into the innovation again, as I mentioned, the interchangeability was a pioneering design change. Um, now ABB and S&C, other manufacturers also um, accommodate these this interchangeability. It's almost a standard across the market, North American market now. Um, they accept uh, all types of sectionalizers, electronic and mechanical, as well as um, 300 amp blades link brake options, and, of course, other manufacturers' fuse holders. So to break into quality, um, what we're going to do today is discuss more of a practical approach to quality. We're going to talk about critical components that affect the continued performance of the cutout in the field, so items that affect things like temperature rise, um, closing in operation, things that affect the linemen as well as uh, general design tests, so um, continuous current operation, um, momentary testing, things like that. These critical components are going to be the things that Chance calls out um, to allow for uh, all those functions to occur. So the, the top, the first two we're going to discuss are the length of the mounting, the fuse holder, and we'll go into alignment, um, silver-plated components, torque of the assemblies, and dielectric strength and dropout. So this first, this first two here, the length of the mounting and the fuse holder. So as you can see in the leftmost photo, this is a gauge tool used to check the what we call the gauge length of the mounting. And that's going to be the distance from your rotation point in your hinge, which is your bottom brass or bottom aluminum bronze component, to the silver plated top contact. This is where the standard design now, the standard interchangeable fuse holder engages. So maintaining this length here is what allows you to perform in the momentary testing when you have a 300 amp blade, 
It also gives you your contact pressure to maintain low temperature rise during 300 amp or 200 amp or 100 amp continuous current operation. <laughs> so this gauge length is something that is 100% checked on all chance units in production. Every cutout coming off the line before it has grease applied to the top, to the top contact has this gauge tool put in it in both our Juarez and Woohoo plants. And again, this this is based on studies we've done with the other manufacturers to ensure that the variation in fuse holder length will accommodate the accommodate the mounting length. On the right photo, you'll see a gauge checking the length of the fuse holder. Just like the mounting, this is uh, critical for our fuse holder to be put in other um, manufacturers' mountings and to maintain the continuing continuous current operation and momentary ratings when you're using a 300 amp blade. The next segment we're going to discuss is the alignment. Alignment is not necessarily critical to the function of the cutout while it's in operation. Once the fuse holder has been closed in, it's typically going to stay in until the fuse operates, um, or it should stay in until the fuse operates at all times. So, what the alignment is going to affect is so your closing in operation. In so most of the time alignment is not going to be or may not be directly under the fuse holder. So if you'll see in the rightmost photo, which is an unacceptable alignment, um, you can see the top tube casting, which is the aluminum bronze part on the top of the fuse holder. You can see it's contacting the load buster hooks on the left side. So if alignment uh, was trying to close this cutout in, say, from the right side at about 30 degrees and happened to put a little bit more pressure on the right side of the fuse holder, you could see the fuse holder uh, hit the front of the load buster hooks and not be able to close in. So checking this in production is, uh, is critical to not only the cutout function, but for the lineman's practical purposes. Um, it's uh, that's that's a serious issue when you have someone uh, trying to operate a unit 30, 30 feet off the ground and not be able to close the fuse holder in on, on a device that's supposed to be simple operation. So again, this is a 100% check. Um, all cutouts coming off the line in our manufacturing facilities are checked for proper alignment, and there's supposed to be a certain degree of clearance between the load buster hook and the fuse holder. Uh, the next critical component is the contact. So on a cutout, you basically have four points of contact. You have the top contact, which is silver plated and engages to the fuse cap, which is in the rightmost photo. The fuse cap is also silver plated. And then at the bottom of the fuse holder in the rightmost photo, you will see the silver plated trunnion, which engages the hinge contact in the center. Most of the time when you look at a hinge contact um, for any manufacturer, you're going to see two uh, pieces down there. So for a total of four pieces for the contacts, you have a front contact, which is silver plated. And because copper is uh, so much weaker, um, most manufacturers are going to use a stainless steel backup spring behind that. Typically with a 100 or 200 amp cutout, it could perform with the copper and not having a stainless steel backup spring, but to maintain that contact pressure um, at 300 amps and through a momentary test, you have to you have to have additional force back there to uh, to withstand the magnetic loads placed on the on the unit during a high fault. The next section is going to be torque. So again, um, with the chance cutout, we have approximately three bolt or four bolts. You have two on the top and two on the bottom on the porcelain units and then or on the polymer units and on the porcelain units you just have two galvanized steel or stainless steel bolts depending on the uh, model number you order. So maintaining this torque is um, is critical for the mechanical operations of the cutout. If you're purchasing something like a load brake unit or a link brake unit that's going to be operated more than a few times, um, which the IEEE standard requires 200 and the CSA requires 250 mechanical operations, that torque is critical to maintaining um, height hardware. 
on those units. Um, sometimes you can, if you can see slip, you've obviously um, missed that in production. So that's something we check 100%. Um, we have uh, two tools we use when we torque all of our bolts in production. We use a hand tool or an, um, an electronic uh, torque wrench to initially tighten all the bolts, and then we use a hand tool to come back and check everything. So it's always a two-step operation with every bolt that we install. One of the critical functions, and it it's actually becoming a little bit more routine now, uh, and we'll discuss that a little bit later, is the dielectric strength. So here what we're looking at is a power frequency dry test on four polymer 27 kV units. Um, you can operate these in series. Um, if you have a, typically you don't, of course you don't want to see a flashover occur, but if you have a flashover occur, you can isolate the unit that flashed over and then and, and retest. So operating in series allows you to do a little bit um, quicker routine testing. This test was performed in our Centralia lab in Missouri. And again, it's an elevated uh, dry withstand test. So for 27 kV, this would be a 42 kV one minute withstand test. Um, again, these are becoming a little more common. Uh, both the IEC and the IEEE standards don't necessarily call out routine sample testing. They all call out um, suggested routine and sample test, and then leave it up to the manufacturer and the user to determine, which is critical for um, performance and for production. Um, but again, uh, with the availability of equipment, um, now you have small little high potential testers that you can purchase that are a little more mobile, um, becoming a little bit more uh, simple to put these into production and uh, do continuous um, continuous checks on your on your cutouts. With our design, um, we're consistently uh, retesting things. So while this isn't done on the production line, we have dielectric tests ongoing in the lab, um, if not weekly, monthly. So again, this is uh, this is something we do almost um, biweekly, and it um, occurs very often on our 27 kV polymer units as well as our 15 kV units. Um, something we've spoken a lot about throughout these conferences is the insulator itself and the core rod. For those involved in IEEE or familiar with NETRAC, there's a lot of testing and uh, qualification going on right now to have polymer insulator, composite polymer insulator standards or tests incorporated into the IEEE standard. Um, the next meeting is in a month, and we will begin all the working groups that will start incorporating these tests. Um, polymer insulator tests are um, very different from that of porcelain. Um, the interface between the core rod and the rubber is a critical feature, and we test that very thoroughly. Um, you'll see our incoming uh, die penetration test on the left. This is a fuchsia die. I think we've discussed this several times. Now, this makes sure you have complete wet out of your glass rod in production and that there are no... Um, critical mechanical flaws in it that could allow leakage current to pass across the across the insulator. Um, another test that we've also discussed is the water penetration test. What this does is it subjects the insulators um, following molding to a 100 hour boil in a salt solution, followed by an elevated uh, power frequency test. So our, for instance, our 27 kV units are run at around 70 kV depending on the uh, a reference unit's flashover point. And we perform this test in our uh, manufacturing facility on 0.3% of all of our insulators we produce. So for every 1,000 insulators, we pull three units, boil them for 100 hours, and then perform an elevated withstand. Um, not only do we do the elevated withstand, but we, uh, we run it for 30 minutes instead of a one-minute withstand. This lets you check the temperature rise across the unit. So if you have any watering breaths, or if you have a rubber change, say the uh, rubber formulation was incorrect and now you have uh, more capable water permeation through the surface, during that elevated um, KV 30 minute time, you're going to see a temperature rise. Typically it's going to occur on the shank 
uh, the shank being the section of the insulator in between the sheds. So I think that was a photo we discussed for those who uh, weren't on the meeting last time. I apologize, but I think that was a photo we looked at last time. It was a, um, a, a thermal camera, a thermal image shot of our water penetration test, and you could actually see temperature rise in the shank, and it's typically going to occur in the middle of the polymer unit. Um, this, this water penetration also checks for bonding of the rubber to the rod. Of course, if you have temperature rise, that obviously means you have some um, contamination in that interface that's causing that temperature rise. Not necessarily water, but um, that is a common cause. This, the dropout test might be one of the most critical tests for cutouts. Again, this is performed 100%. Um, not only do you want to be able to close in the fuse holder, but when the fuse operates, you, of course, want the fuse holder to drop out or the cutout has not functioned at, as a cutout at all. So 100% dropout test is required. This is something, and we'll show this in a second, but this is something that we highly recommend for the customers or the users to perform if, um, if they intend on doing any quality checks on the unit. You can basically perform it by hand without a mounting. What you want to do, um, and I'll try to walk through these photos as best I can, what you want to do is simulate the mounting assembly, the insulator being at about a 15 to 20 degree angle as it's going to hang on the pole. And for those who have installed a fuse holder before, there's an ejector spring on the bottom that you can see the gentleman holding in the rightmost photo. The ejector spring is where the fuse link lays over, and that's what pulls the trunnion that's what pulls the unit up and allows the dropout action to occur. So you pull the ejector spring tight and seat the unit up in the mounting. And once you release that ejector spring, if you are holding it between 15 and 20 degrees, the fuse holder should drop out easily. Um, a common uh, common issue with this that you can see with this is um, most manufacturers now use a um, aluminum bronze alloy on the hinge. And the ears, because the, the aluminum bronze is so strong um, relatively, the ears, which are the front section where the trunnion installs in the rightmost photo in the bottom portion, they become very thin. So when you pull those out, even out of a, a permanent mold, oftentimes you can get bend in those ears. And when you get bend in those ears, they can contact the trunnion and prevent a unit from dropping out. So for performing a 100% performing a check on this is, is almost necessary because you will get variation in, in your castings. It's just, it's, it's unavoidable. Now we'll break into incoming inspection for the manufacturers and the users. The critical components are, of course, the components that build up to make your gauge length on your units. So any incoming critical feature on a hinge in the bottom left-hand portion, or the hood assembly in the top left, or the length of the insulator where all the hardware attaches is going to account for your variation in your gauge length. The critical components all tie back into the incoming inspection of all your parts. And some more common incoming inspections are visual, so, of course, any tears in a polymer housing, um, any debris, any um, rubber debris left around the pins, such as the one in the left photo, is going to affect your installation or our installation of our hardware and cause um, variation in the gauge length. You, of course, don't want your – you, of course, wouldn't want that rubber to eventually um, break loose from under our top mounting pin or a bottom mounting pin, whichever one that is, because that's going to leave your hardware um, loose. So rubber contaminant, rubber tears, of course galvanization chips are all going to be something visual, quick check to let the user and the manufacturer um, inspect the quality of the units coming in and going out the door. So what are the critical inspections that we recommend for the user? Again, um, the user, of course, uh, 
would expect the manufacturers providing a quality product every time, and we do 100% check all the things we've uh, we've listed here. But sometimes you want to go out and, and check for yourself, which um, I know myself and some of the other engineers always love to do. Um, but some of the things that we suggest for the users to do is, of course, check uh, the critical components, which I listed there. Um, of course, silver contacts. Uh, you don't want an incoming part to be uh, lacking the silver plating. You don't want any loose hardware. Uh, poor alignment is going to prevent from closing in, as we discussed. And any rotation issues. If the fuse, when the fuse holder comes installed, as shown in the packaging here, if you can't rotate the trunnion around or rotate the fuse holder around in the mounting, it's obviously not going to drop out. So anything like that. Um, and those things, those things can occur sometimes in shipments. Oftentimes, users um, say when there's a storm order, like a hurricane coming right now, maybe somebody doesn't get a full pallet of cutouts. They only get one or two, and we ship it through UPS or it comes freight. Oftentimes, you can see damage on those units. And so even though we've checked those components twice already, incoming um, may have left uh, some bent ears on the hinge or maybe the um, – the hood is a little bent, or the load buster hooks often can become bent. Anything in the extreme section of the cutout that's going to be impacted by the edges of the box, you can see um, shipping damage from if they're not installed, if they're not coming in on a full pallet. The routine testing. Um, as I mentioned, we're, uh, and all other manufacturers are always looking to improve things. Uh, so we've regularly performed dielectric testing on the insulator. Um, wet testing is also a good check, but um, if there is a dielectric strength issue with the insulator, you're typically typically going to see that with a dry power frequency test. Um, the wet test, for those who know, is a little bit more difficult to perform. The setup time is very long. Um, most standards do not require this for routine testing. Dry testing will call out the dielectric strength of the insulator. Um, being that the Chance Lab has a high power generator. We performed series one interruption several times. Uh, this, I showed a video on the first conference, which everyone was able to see a 27 kV 8 kA um, asymmetrical interruption, which is a series one interruption. That is the fault rating of the unit. System member number. Um, another uh, regularly scheduled check is a temperature rise. Of course, if you have any variation in components coming in, um, you alter that gauge length at all, you're going to uh, see a variation in contact pressure, which is going to lead to a variation in temperature rise. So we perform temperature rise um, not as routinely as dielectric testing, but every year or so we perform temperature rise to requalify the design. Mechanical operations and torque is also uh, regularly performed. Um, almost monthly we take um, some units and make sure that our torques and hardware is all assembled properly and um, the fit is maintained between all of the parts. Again, the final, the final check we do, 0.3% um, of all of our insulators, as I mentioned, are subjected to water penetration. This is before they go into production. And they are all destructively tested to ensure bonding of the rubber to the rod as well as integrity of the, of the dielectric strength of the insulator. And to follow up, both of our plants in Juarez, Mexico, and Wuhu, China are ISO certified for 9001. So to follow up, so our critical components that we discussed for practical application of the cutout are the mounting assembly length, the fuse holder length, alignment, silver plated contacts, secure hardware, dielectric strength of the insulator, and dropout. Most of these checks are performed one well all of these checks, with the exception of dielectric, are performed one hundred percent in our plants. And dielectric is of course more of a routine test. So what can the users look at? Um, the users can visually inspect, com uh, inspect incoming cutouts relatively quickly. Um, most of the checks you're looking for are galvanization, silver, silver plating, things of that nature. 
and this helps you helps to protect you against uh, shipping and handling damage, as well as identify any flaws that the manufacturer may have missed. Now, of course, routine checks, as I mentioned, are becoming more readily available, and this really just applies to the electrical side, and mechanical is almost done 100%. Um, and this is something we're uh, working harder every day to implement in our, in our factories. And with that, that concludes our last segment of the cutout webinar. Um, if anybody has any questions at this time, I didn't see any throughout the presentation. So I would hope that that minute went flawlessly and everyone can take all that data and all that information and then use it effectively. Um, if anybody has any follow-up, um, feel free to contact me. I believe everyone has my email address. And all of our webinar flyers, as well as the presentations, which we've recorded, are going to be posted on this website below. If anyone wants to make note of that at this time, um, publepowersystems.com forward slash cutout. And you should be able to access, hopefully relatively soon, you should be able to access all of our recordings for this presentation in the event you missed one. So at this time, do we have any questions? And once again, all lines are open for your questions or comments. All right, I will take the silence as we do not have any questions. And again, I want to thank everybody for joining the webinar. And I hope everyone is looking forward to any follow-up webinars Hubble is going to be doing this fall. So just stay tuned, and our sales department, our your territory manager, will get in contact with you for any follow-up presentations. Thanks, everybody, and have a nice day. Once again, that does conclude our conference for today. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. Oh, so he's talking about a different order than the one I have.